Matthew 24, let's drop down to here. Um, but immediately, and let me just show this to you. So uh, Jesus is talking about some event when the, the, the disciples ask him, when the, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When he talks about his coming, he starts out in verse 29 by saying, being immediately after the tribulation of those days, <coughs> which immediately starts to link us with um, a an event that we'll see here. Uh, they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of sky, of the sky, and then with that, we'll have this um, great trumpet blast and the gathering together. I'm really sloppy on my drawing there. But you guys get the idea. The classic post-tribbers and the hybrid post-tribbers, they have a good leg to stand on when they say that the rapture is after the tribulation of those days. Because, I mean, I don't see how you could get this wrong. If you know that he's talking about the second coming... The, uh, i.e. the rapture, then when he says immediately after the tribulation of those days, then it's easy, <laughs> right? It's, 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 I think this is really the, um, uh, the, the, the best way to understand this part. It is really the pre-tribbers who think that this coming of the son of man right down here in verse 30 and this gathering together in verse 31, it's the pre-tribbers who want us to believe that this is not the rapture. This is the coming of Jesus for, um, uh, what do we say, the, the elect of Israel and ethnic Israel and the gathering together of Israel, something like that. So I don't, I don't agree with them there. They, they, I, I think they're not following. But... Matthew 24, 29, 31, very key passage for post-tribbers. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, that's a classic rapture passage. And then Revelation 19 is key to their um, understanding of what's going on because in the post-trib view, the green part in my screen here, the classic post-tribbers say that Revelation 19 is the um, Battle of Armageddon. And so for them, that is locates their timing of the second coming slash rapture or rapture slash second coming. Revelation 19, the language suggests that Revelation 19 takes place at the end of the seventh week. And to be sure, let me just pull this up again so you can see it. Uh, Revelation, let's go to 19 so you can see some key passages. Um, when I scroll down in Revelation 19, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb which may or may not take place in heaven, but important or germane to the point for post-trib is that the coming of Christ uh, language that they see here gives them the impression, and, and, and there's some good traction with this, so just follow me for a moment if, you, if you're a pre-rather. The language from in Revelation 19 has Yeshua riding on a white horse, right? Uh, starting at verse 11 of Revelation 19, uh, right? Here I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And so even though when you start in verse 11 and read down through the end of the chapter with the eventual destruction of the beast and the false prophet, they're um, thrown into the lake of fire alive, even though you don't have rapture language, the post-tribbers want us to believe that because the beast and the false prophet meet their end at the end of this chapter, and because this end must signal the end of the 70th week, then they, the, the post-trippers come to the conclusion that this Yeshua riding on a horse event, starting in verse 11, must be the rapture, even though we don't have rapture language. There's nothing in here that tells us that there is a gathering Understand? There's there's not even anything in here that tells us that there's a resurrection. But what they're going to tell me that, well, this is a kind of a bit of a zoom out. It doesn't have to say that there's a rapture. We just know that it must be there because of the previous rapture passages that show up in um, the Olivet Discourses and that show up in Paul's letters, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we know there must be a rapture there, even though John doesn't talk about it. And, you know, that theology, I'm sorry, that, that hermeneutic principle of having an overview or a zoom out or a 
focus on a different event at the time and not mention something that you know must be there. That concept exists in other parts of Scripture. So I get that. I get that. But nevertheless, um, that's essentially what passages they use to bring in. So in the green part, that's post-trib. The blue part to the right of that brings in a slew of passages. Matthew has more detail there. Thessalonians has more detail, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Revelation has a lot more detail. So what the pre-rathers do is we start to start lean heavily on both what Yeshua gave us which of course all of this is built on what Daniel was shown, right? Don't ever lose track of that side of that. I just didn't put it on this chart here because of the fact that when we start talking about tribulation, I'm sorry, when we start talking about rapture and in terms of key scriptures, then because that's where most of the debate is centered, then we have to remember that Paul described the rapture as a mystery. So you're not going to get a lot of it in the Old Testament anyway. Mysteries are those things that are hidden in the old and revealed in the new. Largely, they're hidden in the old and revealed in the new per God's design. So if you go to the Old Testament looking for the mysteries, you you might not see them, or you might see only the kernel form of them. So I didn't put any Old Testament passages in my key scripture list here. But um, what we pre raptors do is we begin to start leaning more heavily on not just what the New Testament says about the rapture, but we lean heavily into the book of Revelations to the book of Revelation to see what the Bible says about the timing of the wrath of God, which in my estimation is largely absent in some of the earlier books that we encounter, such as the Gospels and the letters to the Thessalonians that Paul wrote. Let's keep going. Eminency. What about eminency? The green, which is post-trib, they reject eminency in the classic sense of the word. Christ's return follows specific tribulation events, meaning if you know what eminency is as a pre-tribber, you believe that Jesus could come at any moment, and it's signless, it doesn't require any um, portents or, or precursor events, no prophesied events that have to happen before the rapture could happen. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen a thousand years from now. There's really just no way of knowing when Jesus is coming back. This, of course, is based on one of the passages that says, no man knows the day or the hour, along with a lot of other passages that seem to imply that we Christians are supposed to just be waiting for this thing to happen. So there's the idea of not just what Yeshua said, but there's all the, the idea that he will come like a thief in the night and that we should have this attitude of expecting him to come at any moment. That's the classic version of the word eminency. By comparison, when we look at the blue, which is my um, pre-wrath, remember, we're just comparing post-trib to pre-wrath. The green column you see on your screen right now, running top to bottom, that's the post-trib. The blue column you see on your screen right now, running top to bottom, that's the pre-wrath. What does pre-wrath say about eminency? Well, we reject eminency in the classic sense of the word as well. Both of us are in agreement there. Yet, we do hold to what I'm going to label intra-tribulational eminency, i.e., an imminent rapture once the great tribulation commences. So, unlike the post-tribbers, what we see is that the great tribulation is a specific time frame on God's calendar. <clears throat> So, let's see, maybe, um, yeah, I suppose we'll do this one. Um, if you look at this chart and pay attention to when the Great Tribulation takes place, this is a pre-wrath rapture. The Great Tribulation commences after the midpoint. In fact, it starts at the midpoint with the fifth seal, maybe the fourth seal, but fifth seal is when we see a description of the martyrs. Um, but... The fourth or fifth seal, somewhere, either one of those, I'm, I'm, I've heard pre rathers go both, both ways. The Great Tribulation commences, and once the Great Tribulation kicks off, at that point in time, we Christians can start looking for our blessed hope, which is our deliverance from this rapture. Deliverance, which will also result in us a, um, an ex being excused or um, being... Um, not appointed to the wrath of God. But primarily, what I'm focusing at the moment is that the Great Tribulation is said by Jesus to be cut short by the rapture. So I'm circling the rapture here. 
And so my point is that when we talk about imminency, we don't know when the rapture will take place. We do take Jesus' words at face value as well. No man knows the day or the hour of his second coming or his rapture. We can use the same. I would rather just say no one knows the, second, the day or hour of his parousia. But the rapture being the initiating event that we pros, that we pre-rapturers hold to, then this means that the Great Tribulation is going to be cut short by the rapture. And since we don't know when the rapture is going to take place, we can say that the rapture is imminent, but only insofar as after the Great Tribulation has begun. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen, but we do know when the Great Tribulation is going to happen. But we don't, we don't know how long the Great Tribulation will be. We don't know how when the Great Tribulation will run will be uh, cut short. But we do agree or hold to an idea that it will be cut short. So that's what we're referring to. Let's keep going. Uh, how much of this can I do? We're at 23 minutes left in the study. I'm 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 not trying to rush, but I'm trying to keep a a, a moderate pace because we've covered a lot of this material before in in some way, shape, or fashion in my study. So there's no need for me to park out on it very long. What's the role of the church in terms of Daniel's 70th week as regards post-trib versus pre-wrath? Remember, post-trib is the green cell here that I've just highlighted. Post-trib says that the church will experience the entire seven-year tribulation, which may or may not include some parts of God's wrath. Again, um, this is necessary for the church to go through the tribulation period, the tribulation time period, because of the reality that the church is not quite ready to, well, let me say it this way, i got to be careful. There are aspects of the, there are parts of, components of the church that we could say represent a compromised people group, a compromised stance. There are too many people in the world who claim to be Christian, that claim to be part of the church, that aren't truly part of the church. How can they be identified and separated? How will we know? Well, of course, God knows, Jesus knows, the Holy Spirit knows who belongs to him, right? He knows who who his bride is. However, for the purpose of God's word to be fulfilled, for the tribulation to um, play its part in this whole scheme of things, and for Satan to be allowed to persecute the saints on one degree, and yet at the same time protect those who take his mark, then there needs to be some form of litmus test, a time of trial. And the church has always been under persecution for her stance on the truth. This is something that's part and parcel of being a Christian. You can just get it in your head right now that if you are a true believer, you quite possibly, if if the Lord allows us to, to um, live long enough, you will quite possibly or probably suffer persecution in some way, shape, or fashion. That's just part and parcel of being a Christian. It's expressed in the verse that I'll flash in post-production. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And in case you don't get it from one verse, in case you think I'm proof texting or cherry picking, go back and read the entire letter of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. The entire two letters that Paul wrote to that church centers on a a theme that's related to suffering for the cause of Christ, right? Jesus said it best, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And so it's no wonder that the early church began to brace themselves for the tribulation that they would experience as a result of bearing the name of Yeshua. They they didn't somehow think to themselves, maybe we're not going to go through it. Maybe God's going to rapture us before we have to suffer any hardship. You can hear the kind of the slight mocking in my voice because I'm trying to gently prod you pre-tribbers out there who have been taught that you're not going to have to suffer any tribulation. In my in my opinion, in reality, this is I'm, I'm sidetracking for a moment. I'm chasing a rabbit, but permit me. In my opinion, the theology that the pre-tribbers have been taught that God is not going to punish his bride and that we've been excused from the wrath of God, I think that biblical truth is solid. However, I think what happens is the nomenclature, the wording, the equivocation, the ambiguity slips in to the theology of not being um, uh, pointed to the wrath of God and the, the sloppy 
um, nomenclature and differentiating between terms of wrath and God and wrath of Satan uh, leads to pre-tribbers saying that we're not going to have to go through the tribulation because they attribute the tribulation as either all of God's wrath or all of Satan's wrath. They're all mixed together. And so in their theology, it's the pre-tribbers that take um, the wrath of God, the wrath of Satan, and they mix those two together. They take the tribulation period and the day of the Lord period, and they mix that all together. And we've got this big, giant mess of bad stuff that we have verses in the Bible that say that you, church, the bride, you're excused from that. And so the pre tribbers say, I guess we're not going to have to go through that. And I'm thinking, not good, not, not good, um, not good uh, Bible uh, practice, not good um, uh, b Bible study there. Okay, so back to my little chart. The green that I've highlighted, the role of the church, they'll go through everything, or most of the tribulation, all of the tribulation and, and most of God's wrath, but the final last bowls part, maybe they're excused from that. That's why I say may not include some parts of God's wrath. I can't get a, a clear answer out of some of the, there's, there's not one unified, not, not more of one unified voice going on there in post-tribbers, I guess. Pre-wrathers still have a lot more uni unity going on, at least in the classic sense of the word when you talk about pre-wrathers such as um, the Rosenthal's, right, Zion's Hope Ministries, um, Kirshner's Ministry, Eschatos Ministries, Alan Kirshner, um, Chris White, um, uh, Charles Cooper, um, uh, uh, Aaron Eggman, and of course, yours truly, Ariel Hanavi. So what do we pre rathers say? Blue section on your right, this is the pre wrath view. What do we say about the role of church? The church will experience persecution during the Great Tribulation, but is rescued before any part of God's wrath. And I don't want you to think that this means that we're not going to go through, that we Christians are not going to go through the um, birth pangs. We, we most certainly are. So let me go back over to, I think this chart is a good part. If you look at this pre-wrath rapture chart, the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, the first three and a half years, is marked out as the beginning of sorrows. This is per our Lord Yeshua in Matthew, right? You can see that's why I've got Matthew listed there. Well, we Christians go through the beginning of sorrows. Indeed, let me just say it this way. According to the both the post-trib and the pre-wrath, everybody goes through the beginning of sorrows. That means the Christians, the Jews, Israel, and the entire world. Everybody goes through the beginning of sorrows. We just label it the beginning of sorrows. We don't call it the tribulation period. And that's not to say that it won't be tribulational. In nature, it most certainly will be troubling. It will be tribulational. However, Jesus never called that period the tribulation. As far as I can tell, he just called it the beginning of sorrows. By comparison, at the midpoint, then we have the um, great tribulation that is reserved primarily for Christians and Jews, but primarily here even for Christians, not necessarily primarily for Jews. Because even though the devil wants to um, persecute Jews, a, a remnant of them will be protected in the wilderness when God says, flee into the wilderness where you've got a place prepared for you, right? Go back and read um, Matthew, I'm sorry, not Matthew, Revelation chapter 12. So um, going back over to the chart I'm working from, the church will experience persecution during the Great Tribulation. Of course, this is after the entire world experiences the, the birth pangs. But the church will experience the Great Tribulation, but the role of the church is that we are rescued before any part of God's wrath. Let's keep going. We've got a lot of time. Um, on the far left, the cheese-colored section, or orange or light orange now, tan, I guess. I don't know what, what color you call that. What is the distinction between Israel and the church? Okay, here's where I get a lot of kickback again because of what appears to be a dispensational perspective that the pre raptors still hold to. And I have a confession to make to you that I haven't been speaking of lately because I myself just basically found out maybe last week or the week prior. Marv Rosenthal, who is considered one of the fathers of the pre-wrath position, he's the one that wrote the book, and I'll flash this in post-production, The Pre-Wrath Raptor of the Church. He is, or was at the time that I was listening to him teach on pre-wrath, um, he was known as a dispensationalist. He was known for being a dispensationalist, which is something that I myself don't hold to, and something I'm not entirely certain that his son 
David Rosenthal also holds to. I'm not certain. I need to hear David say it. I heard Marvin Rosendahl say it. He said so. He said, I'm a dispensationalist. Well, why is that relevant? It's because when we're starting to look at these distinctions between Israel and the church, when we look at the classic post-trib position, and we can just flash those five gentlemen that I've been using on my screen from some time, reading from left to right, or as you're probably seeing them on screen now, we've got Dr. Michael Brown on the left. He's a post-tribber. We've got Professor Craig, Craig Keener next to him. He's a post-tribber. We've got Joel Richardson in the middle. He's a post-tribber. We've got... Um, not in the middle, I'm sorry. I know, uh, reading from left to right. P uh, third one uh, from left to right. Joel Richardson, he's a post-tripper. And then next to him on the far right that you're seeing on your screen in post-production is that's um, that's Professor Doug, Doug Moo. All four of these gentlemen are post-trippers. And I'll put one more guy right in the middle there, um, Pastor John Piper. He's a post-tripper too. So we've got five very prominent post-trippers. You're seeing them on the screen right now. They're all well-respected, well-trusted, and guess what? As a pre pre rather myself, I actually recommend all five of these gentlemen's teachings in terms of um, uh, sanctification, in terms of right living, in terms of understanding your Bible, in terms of holiness, in terms of spirit walking. I mean, all five of these guys, in terms of their stance on pro-Israel, all five of these gentlemen are, are rock solid, um, highly recommended by my, from my perspective. But guess what? All five of them are non Pre-Rathers, as far as I can tell. So why did I bring this up? When we look at the distinction between Israel and the church, as far as I can tell, all five of these gentlemen would say that there's no clear distinction between Israel and the church. The church and Israel endure the tribulation together in terms of who goes into the tribulation and who gets raptured together and who experiences the second coming. All five of these, as far as I can tell, would agree with one single second coming slash rapture. So the rapture and the second coming are the same event, which is a signature uh, perspective from the post-trip camp. And in so doing, it's not necessary to dispensationally separate the church from Israel. We, the, we all together, because we're all God's elect, we all experience the same second coming. And it's the rapture that does separate believers from unbelievers, but even still, we just go up and then we come right back down so that we can usher in the millennial kingdom. So that's why I mentioned all five of these gentlemen. And that's why I'm speaking, going back to my chart now. Let's let that, the, those, uh, the, the, the five gentlemen faces should be gone. Should now be looking back at my chart in the green. No clear distinction between the church and Israel. That, well, let me back up. I'm not saying that there's no distinction between the church and Israel. I'm saying that there's no clear distinction between second coming slash rapture event as far as um, when when it happens, who experiences what. But by comparison, and here's where I get flack from the post-tribbers, from those same five gentlemen, many of them would say that the pre-wrath pre position, which I'm about to describe when it comes to distinction between Israel and the church, there is a distinction. This is what we pre rathers say. There is a distinction between Israel, which remains on earth, and the church which is raptured in terms of those events. And what that sounds like to those five gentlemen and other post-tribbers who follow after those, those uh, that post-trib theology, when I as a pre rather say that there is a distinction between Israel, which remains on earth, and the church which is raptured, I sound suspiciously like a dispensationalist. And I'm trying to tell you that no, I'm not teaching dispensational theology. But yes, I do believe that when the rapture happens, Israel will not yet be rapture ready. She needs to endure more of, in fact, she needs to endure the wrath of God at, at, at some level in order to purge her from her disbelief in Messiah, right? If the rapture were imminent, let's just follow with me for a moment, all right? Let's just Everyone, pre-tribbers, mid-tribbers, post-tribbers, pre-rathers. Let's all four of us imagine for a moment that the rapture is imminent. What if that truth were just airtight theology that, that, that all four of us agreed on, that there, was, that there were passages in the Bible that bore this out in no amb ambiguous terminology, that the rapture is absolutely, absolutely imminent, could happen? What if Jesus actually said it that way? Right? No man knows that there they are because when I come back, it I, I could come back at any moment and there's nothing. I mean, he actually like elaborated and made it 
absolutely certain. What if that were the case? Then answer me this question right now. This is 2024. If the rapture could happen at any moment, like as in the next second before I even finish my... Wow, what happened? Right, yeah, I was trying to fool you, right? Silence because I got raptured. Okay, I'm just, just being funny. No, you get my point. If the rapture could happen at any moment, then answer me this question right now, all of you Christians listening to the sound of my voice, watching this video, listening to this um, podcast. Would Israel go right now? Is Israel rapture ready? Look at Israel in the Middle East right now. Yeah, that Israel. Not the spiritual Israel that the church sometimes identifies themselves with. Look at national Israel in the Middle East right now. That group. Look at Jews worldwide. Let's just put, call Israel for what it is. Jews worldwide, no matter where you're at, who have rejected Jesus. Are they rapture ready? Not on your life. Which means if the rapture is imminent and it could happen right now... Israel is going to miss it. I'm sorry, but that's the sad reality of the state of affairs of Israel today. At this moment, they are not rapture ready. And I think every Christian listening to the sound of my voice, that includes all five of those gentlemen I just flashed on the screen, I believe they would agree with me that Israel would absolutely not be raptured right now. You're trying to tell me that all those unbelieving Jews would go up to meet Jesus right now? Not only would Jesus not um, embrace them because they've rejected him, but they don't want to embrace him, right? I mean, the the misunderstanding of who Jesus is is largely their blindness. But Jesus, I mean, he's standing there with arms open wide. He's like, he's ready to embrace them. But they're like, nope, we're not having you. We don't know who you are. We're not embracing you as our as our Messiah. So why would he rapture them? They don't want a rapture. So they're not rapture ready. So why am I being so pointed at this moment? It's because there's a there's a reason why we pre raptors say that at some level there must be a distinction that Israel remains on earth and the church which is raptured. However, even the surface level pre post tribber would have to agree with me. Let me turn to a passage. I don't mean to wax long on this, but even the classic post tribber would probably have to agree when I turn to Revelation chapter 12 and I scroll down to starting in verse um, 13. And John writes, Revelation 12, 13, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who's the woman? 